I want to just read something that I partially quoted to you from memory, but it just reestablishes thoroughly and completely what we're really studying here. 69 weeks discussed in the book of Daniel, Daniel 9.26. Revelation has to do with the 70th week. The book of Revelation is the 70th week. 69 weeks were determined at Calvary or the cutting off of the Messiah. They have already been determined upon the Jews, and this is history for the Jews. The 70th week is yet to be determined upon the Jewish nation. John, in Revelation, picked up where Daniel left off. What Daniel didn't see, John saw in detail until the end of time prophecy. The gap between the 69th and 70th week is the church age. The Jews did not see it. We are studying, we are studying here tonight about the future of the present day nation of Israel. Chapter 8. It says here, and when he had opened the seventh seal, circle seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. I don't know if that means exactly 30 minutes or not. Two, <clears throat> and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So now we're going to go through seven trumpets, which are seven phases of wrath. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, in verse 2, have the seven trumpets. Three, another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints. Underscore prayers of all saints. <clears throat> with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. In other words, you remember, you know how many prayers of saints have gone up in the last 2,000 years? Think of it. Look what happens here. And those prayers went up in mercy and burden and concern for others, basically speaking. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And underscore this, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. In other words, the prayers of the saints have gone up in mercy and love and burden. But one of the curses is that in this particular trumpet, an angel takes that golden censer and dips it into those prayers with the fire. And those prayers are hurled out back into the earth in reverse with judgment. They went up in mercy, but they come back in, in judgment against those that know not God and will not serve him. Six, <clears throat> and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Above verse seven, write trumpets and put a circle around it. Verse 7, the first angel, circle first angel, sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. That's incredible, even to try to picture that. Underscore, third part of trees, the green grass was burnt up. Eight, and the second angel, circle that, sounded, and... And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. Underscore, third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Here's the curse about a third part of the sea becoming as blood. Blood is thicker than water. And it coagulates. Water doesn't. So the engines in the ships would catch fire and burn. And the fish and all life 
would die because they wouldn't be able to breathe. Verse 10, And the third angel circled that sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, underscore third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, underscore fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, underscore Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. They were poisonous. Twelve, and the fourth angel circled that, sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. And so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So with one third less sunlight, the crops wouldn't mature. It would cause famine, tremendous hunger, difficulties. Thirteen. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe. They were really crying, Repent, repent, repent to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet the sound. In the bottom margin of this page in my Bible, in the book of Revelation, I wrote in there, If conditions are as bad as pictured in Revelation, what then must hell be like? <clears throat> Chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust, underscore locust upon the earth, and it to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Verse 5 says, To them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment, torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Uh. And the shapes of the locusts, verse 7, were like unto horses prepared into battle, and their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth, means long, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. I mean, imagine such a creature with the power to strike you, and the sting is as the sting of a scorpion, and it won't kill you. You can't die, even though you want to die. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. You couldn't kill them or smash them. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses returning to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet loose, the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. At this point, another third of the world's population will be slain. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jaseth, and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, out of their mouths issued fire, and smoke, and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed, by fire, by smoke, brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And look at this in verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not, underscore repented not, 
of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, wood, which neither can, can see, nor hear, nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. Chapter 10. Chapter 10 is extremely interesting, and it gives us great insight to events taking place in chapter 11. Here in chapter 10, John says, on the Isle of Patmos, he's envisioning all of this, he's watching all of this. He says, and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, his face was as it were the sun, his feet as pillows of fire. He had in his hand a little book open. Everyone say, little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. Underscore time no longer. So evidently time as we know it will not be there. Seven, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, circle seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And John again says, and the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth, so, and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, underscore this, verse 11, John, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Chapter 11. And there was given me a reed likened to a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. See, this is all Jewish terminology. Underscore this, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. You will remember in the tabernacle, in the temple of Solomon, the, the Gentiles could come into the outer court, but they could not go any farther. So this is all Jewish terminology. In other words, after... Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, there will be no more Gentile martyrs saved. The door is totally closed to the Gentiles here. <clears throat> and verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, underscore two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. That's three and a half years. These are the two olive trees, that's Jewish terminology, underscore two olive trees, and the two candlesticks, underscore two candlesticks, that's Jewish terminology, standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man shall hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These prophets have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast um, that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Now look here. 
and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spirit, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. And they of the people and the kindred and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, underscore three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. That's the greatest insult that could happen to a Jew, is not to bury their body. But these two Jewish witnesses, they, their bodies will be left dead in the streets. It'll be telecast all over the world. Look at this in verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth with their convicting power of preaching. They'll be like Christmas time. They'll be so glad these two prophets are dead. They'll send gifts to each other. But verse 11, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Underscore that verse. Verse 12, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. And that same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now, <clears throat> who are these two witnesses? I was taught in Bible school the two witnesses are Elijah and Moses, and I don't believe that. And there's a reason I don't believe it, and I'll share my reason with you. And if you agree with me, I'll give you an A on the exam. If you don't, I fail you. <laughs> At least I'm honest, right? <clears throat> Most people believe that those two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. And the reason for that thinking is because these two witnesses will have the same power in their earthly ministry to repeat and do what Moses and Elijah did in their earthly ministry. Okay? <clears throat> but it cannot be Moses, and here's why. The Bible says, it is appointed to man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Moses died and was buried on Mount Pisgah. If God brings him back as one of those witnesses in the tribulation period, and he has slain again, in the streets of Jerusalem, as the Bible says, he will have died or been killed twice, which would be a breach of contract with God's purpose and plan for man. That's why I'm believing God will keep me alive until the rapture. I won't have to go through this again. I've already done this once. I'm hoping that God will keep my mind clear and sharp and that I will be alive until the rapture. Everyone um, like that idea? <laughs> I don't want to go through that again. <clears throat> but in this case here, Moses died and was buried, so that basically disqualifies him. There are some people who say, this: the other witness, one of them is Elijah. See, Elijah never died. He was caught away in a chariot of fire, so he never died. Some people say it was Enoch, but it cannot be Enoch, because Enoch was a Gentile. And God would never send the Gentile to preach to the Jews. They wouldn't hear him. And Enoch was a type of the church, the Gentile church, which never dies. The Bible says of Enoch, he walked with God and took him, or he was not. So it can't be Enoch. He was the perfect type of the Gentile church and the church will never die. So he's disqualified on those two counts. Who then is the second witness? In the end of the book, the chapter 10 of Revelation, John is an old man at this time in exile on Patmos. He's seeing this vision, recording this for us. But this angel says to him at the end of this chapter. Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. When did John ever do that? There is no biblical record anywhere that he ever did that. 
but it was prophesied that he would. John never died. He was raptured out of that Isle of Patmos, just like Elijah was caught away. Here is the thing that clinches it for me. If you go to the last chapter of the Gospel of John, it's an incredible setting here. The last chapter of the Gospel of John. We've got, we've got uh, a situation here. Jesus is talking to the disciples and um, Jesus asked Peter, about 15, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? The answer was, yea, Lord. And then he asked the question a second time, a third time. And every time Peter says, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. In fact, the third time, in verse 17, Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him that same question three times. So Jesus said, feed my sheep. And then in verse 18, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and others shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not, signifying by what death he would die. Most theologians and scholars agree that it meant he would be crucified. And... Um, <clears throat> Verse 19 says, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith of them, Follow me. Then Peter. See, John, as far as I can figure, John the disciple probably was called by Jesus when he was a teenager, maybe late teens. He was the youngest. And evidently Jesus treated him like his son. John leaned upon the breast of Jesus. And knowing human nature the way I do, I'm quite sure that there was a little jealousy over John. And here it pro it's proven here. So Jesus has prophesied to Peter what's going to happen to him. Verse 20, then Peter turning about, seeing, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, and ba basically Peter was saying, well now you've told me what's going to happen to me. Um, he said, looking at John, what shall this man do? In verse 21, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Look at the next verse. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. They interpreted that to mean that John would not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, He shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And there's no record any place in the world where John's body was ever buried that I know anything about. So the disciples believed that John would not die. And geez, the angel had prophesied Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. There's no biblical record he ever did it, but he will do it. And when the angel said, or the voice of the Lord said, go and take that little black book out of his hand and eat it up. It'll be sweet to thy mouth, but in thy belly it will be bitter. In other words, it's sweet to the taste, thinking, he would preach to many peoples and nations and kings the glory of Jesus. But the digestion of it was, he would be killed bitter. The digestion process would be bitter. Because he would lie dead in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half years. See how flawless this is. God, by using those two witnesses, has one witness from the old covenant, and he has a witness from the New Covenant, the New Testament. Elijah from the Old Testament, John from the New Testament. That's why in a few minutes when we study Revelation chapter 15, the Jewish martyrs, the Remnitsi Jews, who are also slain when the Antichrist breaks his covenant in the midst of the week, in Revelation 15 it says, they also are caught up around the throne and they sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. 
They got the song of Moses from Elijah. They got the song of Jesus from John. There's a witness from both covenant, and they're both Jewish, and neither one of them died. Powerful. I'll close my eyes. How many of you see it? <laughs> it's incredible. I was not taught this in school. I got a hold of this later, a few years later. It's incredible, the plan of God, the will of God in the earth. Amen? Now if you look at verse 14 in chapter 11. How many of you like that explanation? Does it make sense to you? It does. <clears throat> so I am sure that you'll have a lot of um, interesting sessions with people you know teaching this. Verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there, was, there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms, underscore this, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. Now, let's go to chapter 13. I'm sorry, it's chapter 12. i got ink written all over this. <clears throat> chapter 12. Here's what you're seeing here, and this will make more sense later, but what you're seeing in this chapter is, it represents, there are two groups of Jews in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. There are the remnant seed Jews. These are converts of the two prophets that preach in this first three and a half years of the tribulation period. These are the ones that are sealed uh, and all of that. But then you have the man-child Jews. The Bible talks about uh, the ranch, the Jews in Isaiah ruling with a rod of iron. They're, they're exactors of righteousness. And uh, you have some of these things in your notes. But here in Revelation chapter 12, it repre represents both the remnant seed Jew and the man-child Jew. It says, and there, was, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman. That woman represents Israel, both the remnant seed Jew and the man-child Jew. Clothed with the sun, the moon, 12 stars. That's all Jewish terminology, the dream of Joseph. Moon, stars, sun. So, <clears throat> And two says, and she, this woman Israel, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. This has been going on since the crucifixion. Israel has struggled. They've been in this birth pain to be delivered ever since the crucifixion. If you continue reading, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for devour, to devour her child as soon as it was born. Verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child, where, where we refer to these as man-child Jews, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, underscore rod of iron, and her child, underscore this, was caught up unto God, into his throne. That means caught up in favor. <clears throat> Verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness. Put a circle around the word wilderness. Where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. <clears throat> These Jews that are sealed against death, what happens is when the Antichrist breaks his covenant in the midst of the week and he slays the remnant of Jews, these man-child Jews flee from Jerusalem into the southern extremities of the land, into a place called Edom. And there's some fascinating details about this. <clears throat> and they're there for three and a half years. The prophets, the two prophets that preached are dead. They've ascended. The Antichrist has broken his covenant. 
and um, here you have Israel, the man-child, the remnancy Jews, and the remnancy Jews are fleeing, and they and they are able to they are slain rather, but the man-child Jews are fleeing into this place called in the wilderness. Eight. It says here, <clears throat> verse seven. And there was war in heaven, Michael, remember he's the warrior angel of Israel, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. See, Satan's fall line, he was cast out of the holy mount of God, He's now the prince and power of the air, but during this time he will be cast out into the earth. He won't just be the prince and power of the air. At this point he will be cast into the earth. Then he, fall, he is cast later into the bottomless pit, chained for a thousand years, and he ends up in the lake of fire. So his whole process has been just down, 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 starting in heaven, the holy mount of God, the air, the earth, the pit, and the lake of fire. He's on his way down, but this church is on its way up. So that is interesting sidelight there. I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, underscored by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time, right in their headquarters on earth. At this time, the devil's headquarters will be on earth. 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which, the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman, these are the man-child Jews, were given to, sealed against death, were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Time is a year, two, and times is two years, and half a time is half a year. So it's three and a half years from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood. That water means an army of soldiers, and you can prove that later. It explains that in the book of Revelation. But he sent an army after them to catch these, these Jews that are fleeing and to bring them back. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood or destroyed. And the earth helped the woman, underscore earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood of this army that the Antichrist sends, which the dragon cast out of his mouth by orders. He gave the order. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's where we get the remnant seed Jews. So underscore remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They are converts of these two prophets. See how it all begins to fall in place? The Bible explains itself. Chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads. That means seven forms of government, because the Roman Empire had seven forms of government. And ten horns, that is the Roman Empire, as I said before. And upon his horns, ten crowns, upon his heads, the name of blasphemy, etc. Now, here in chapter 13, <clears throat> this represents, number one, the Roman Empire. Write that down. Number one, the Roman Empire. Number two, the Antichrist as head of the Roman Empire. Verse 2, And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Remember what we studied about the nature of the empires, the Gentile empires? The Antichrist is all of that. 
And the dragon, the spirit of the devil, gave him power in his seat and his authority. And I saw one of the heads, one of the forms of government, as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, underscore his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, because a new empire did not take over after the Roman Empire. Notice something. When Babylon fell, the media Persian Empire took over. The language was gone, structure, everything. Media Persia took over. When they were conquered by Greece in 333, 338 BC, the Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire crushed all of this out and took over. And then the Roman Empire crushed the Grecian Empire and it was divided into two parts in government, etc., as you can study later. But the Roman Empire, no world power ever rose again to control the whole world after the Roman Empire. It was the last one. And even though it appeared that the Roman Empire was destroyed and crushed from a deadly wound, that wound healed, and out of that old Roman Empire, that power, that government will rise again, and all the world will wonder after that. That's happening right now. That's happening right now. That's why they're talking about a one world order. It comes out of that Roman Empire, a one world church or religious system. It comes out of that system. And all nations are turning against Israel. And as I said, the nations around the Mediterranean Sea are governed by, by military power. And the kings and the sovereigns have been deposed. It's all there. You can, you can feel the spirit of that thing in the earth right now. Look at this. <clears throat> it says, and I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. That's the remnant Jews. That's these these converts, because the raptured saints are already gone, <clears throat> to overcome them. And power was given him over kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If, many, if any man have an ear to hear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword, etc. Now, verse 11. And I beheld another beast. This is the false prophet. See, the Antichrist will have a false prophet that will speak for him. So here is where it is. This is the religious leader of the harlot church. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image, goes right back to the type of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel, an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. <clears throat> 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast, the image of the beast should be killed. And it's very interesting with rob robotic engineering the way it is, that, that, that beast will be able to electronically speak. You hear it on, hear it on but I'm sh quite sure, I mean, in the early 1900s, they thought, how can this thing be? Now we know how it can be because of the age of electronics and with computer chips and all kinds. There are so many things you carry that everything about you, you carry it on your person. They've got a new driver's license in New York State right now. I don't have it. But the new one that has come out, when you go through 
a checkpoint in an airport, in that strip, on that driver's license, everything about you. There is no security left. Security just doesn't exist. It's one of the most frightening things, but it's all a part of this end time that we live in. <clears throat> Verse 16, And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. They can use TV. They can use computerization. They can track you right down. And that no man might buy nor sell, save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Man was, bought, was created on the sixth day. So six is man's number. So the, the, the mark of the beast is 666 is what it is. That's where that comes from. And it says so. 18, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six, 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 six. Powerful. And right now, in the military, um, I have friends in a lot of places, and they've told me some things that really is not out to the public. But in America, they... Um, when you join the military in, the, in America, the United States, you become property of the government, so they can do with you pretty much what they want. And they have planted these computer chips in some of our American soldiers in the forehead and in the hand. And uh, they've been experimenting with it. They have discovered that the, the, the computer chip is recharged by a lithium battery inside of it. It's quite small. And they have discovered that if the computer chip is put in the forehead, the temperature on the forehead changes more often than any other part of the body, so it recharges that lithium battery. So the, the, the note of the best, the most... Uh, uh, the, the most uh, convenient... And the best place to put this chip, they're saying, is in the forehead. Because it keeps recharging that lithium battery. However, as we read through here, those that take that mark of the beast in the tribulation period, they, great sores come into their body. In some of the human beings they've experimented with, with this computer chip, that lithium has leaked out of the battery and their skin has just filled with huge sores. Exactly as the Bible says. I did some teaching like this, and there was one mother in the congregation. Her son was in the army in America. And uh, she was just it was something. She just believed it. So she talked to her son in the army and told him about all of this. He said, Ah, mom, he said, I've never heard anything about this. Two weeks later, he called his mother just upside down. He said, where did Brother Strong King get that information? He said, we've just had a session. He said, wherever he got the information, it's true. He said, you've got to help me get out of here. We've got to pray I get out of here before they require such a thing of me. We're dealing with this right now. It's not coming, people. It's here, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> chapter 14. This is the preview chapter, right? Preview chapter here. <clears throat> and um, let's just briefly read here. It says in verse 2, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of great thunder, and uh, harpers with harps. Uh, out of five, verse 5, and in their mouth was found no guile. It's talking about uh, these here, 144,000. And then verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains thereof. Verse 8, right preview above this verse, <clears throat> because it's a preview of what's coming, it's not here yet. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Is that the final fall? Nine. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, 
The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and who rece whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And he goes on. If you look in verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. If you look in verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. What is, could someone close that door? What is very interesting about this is that I have stood in the area of the battle of Armageddon. I have been there. I've been to Megiddo. If you stand in the Mount Carmel mountain range and look over that vast area, Megiddo, the whole area is surrounded by low mountains. There's no valleys that cut through. That whole area of the Battle of Armageddon or Megiddo, it's covered, just surrounded by uh, small low mountains. It looks like a gigantic soup bowl is what it looks like. Napoleon stood there in his military conquest and said it was the most perfect battlefield he had ever, ever seen in all of his military travels and conquest. The Bible says basically the wrath in that battle of Armageddon will be so great that the blood will be neck deep to the horse's bridles. There's another school of thought that says the fury will be so great, the stamping, that it will splatter the blood high from the ground up to the horse's bridles. There's two schools of thought on that. I am more inclined to follow what the Bible says. It could be that deep because I've seen, I've seen that area. I've walked right through it. I've, oh, I've looked over it. I've stood in the Mount Calmer mountain range and viewed all of that. Now, in chapter 15, and I saw another sign in heaven. This is the remnant seed in heaven. Remember I mentioned that they are slain by the Antichrist when he breaks his covenant in the midst of the week? There's so many details we could spend weeks in, but just for the basics. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the, in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, underscore had gotten the victory over the beast. These are those of the tribulation period. And over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And here it is in verse 3. These are Jewish martyrs. And as I said, there's, an, there's a subsequent rapture of the Gentiles. The first part, and here is the subsequent rapture of the Jewish martyrs that are caught up. And look what it says here. I quoted it before, but you can actually read it. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. See, it just reflects back to the truth that those two prophets were Elijah and John. They got the songs of Moses from Elijah and the song of the Lamb from John. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now, go down to verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, which liveth forever and ever. So at this point, we have looked at seven seals, seven trumpets, and now... We're going into seven vials, and each set of seven becomes more terrible, more ferocious, more devastating. <clears throat> Who liveth, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. 
chapter 16. Here we are. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Two, and the first, circle that, went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. There's where those sores come out that I mentioned. Three, and the second circle that angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man that would be heavily coagulated and every living soul died in the sea four and the third circle that angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood and I heard the angel of the waters say thou art righteous O Lord which art and wast and shalt be because thou hast judged thus for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another voice out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth, and the circle that, angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Nine, and men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. 10. And the fifth circle, that angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. This has to do with China. Russia will be destroyed during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period here. <clears throat> and the kings of the east will come across deep in the tribulation period and they will meet their doom that rises against Israel and the people of that time. So it's, it's really something. I remember when I was um, in high school there was a tremendous struggle uh, in our government. They were so afraid that Russia being communist and China being communist at that time would get together because our government felt if Russia and China got together, they could take over the world. But they didn't understand the Bible. In the Bible, the kings of the East, China and Russia, are never, ever mentioned together. If, they, if our government had known the Bible, they would never have feared such a thing. Because the Chinese are basically a pure race. Russia is a mixture of everything. And basically the Chinese government chides Russia because of that. It's a whole different world. The Chinese culture is a whole different world. But out of that, God is going to take a church for his name's sake, as we have discussed. Out of every nation, there will be people rise. But those who don't want it will not get it. And they'll be left to face all of this. I want to be in the rapture. I want to be in the rapture. I want Jesus to come. Tremendous. Now, <clears throat> the kings of the east come across uh, in verse 12, in the sixth angel. 13, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouths of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. And these are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God. Underscore that great day of God. Behold, I come as a thief. Behold, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Verse 16, and they gathered them together together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. That's where it happens. That's where it's mentioned. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. 19, and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, 
and great Babylon came in the remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. C can you imagine such an earthquake? And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Now, chapter 17, and this becomes very interesting. This is the fall of the harlot church. So above chapter 17, write fall of the harlot church. And it's the religious fall. <clears throat> Verse 1. And there came out, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgments of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Underscore many waters. And look down at verse 15. And here's Revelation. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's why I said the Antichrist sent a flood. He sent an army by his command after those fleeing Jews. And by the way, going back to that for a moment, there are, there are groups of Christians that understand a lot of what I'm saying. When those man-child Jews come marching out of Edom at the, at the Battle of Armageddon, they will take Jerusalem to the half of the city. You find this in Zechariah chapter 14. <clears throat> And they will be powerful. Right now, there are Bible societies that in the files, the caves of that area in Edom, they are stashing in there thousands and thousands of copies of the New Testament. Those Jews will be there for three and a half years, and they're trusting they will find those New Testaments and read and study and become believers in Jesus. Is that not amazing? That's amazing. <clears throat> Back to verse 1. So the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. There's no sex involved here. You should write in there in parentheses, no sex involved. It's the mixture of religion and wickedness. That's what the fornication is. It's a spiritual fornication. It's the mixture of wickedness and religion. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads, that's seven forms of government, it's the Roman Empire, and ten horns. There were ten nations in the Roman Empire. It goes back to Daniel 7 and 7. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints, with the blood of martyrs, of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and and is not, and yet is. Verse 9. <clears throat> Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, seven forms of government. But also, Rome is built on seven mountains, and I've been to all seven of them. On top of every mountain is the Catholic Church. 
The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, seven forms of government in this Roman Empire. So in verse 10, you should underscore seven kings. Five are fallen. In other words, at the time that John wrote this, five forms of government within the Roman Empire had already fallen. One is, John wrote in that seventh form. That's where he lived, in the seventh form of government in the Roman Empire. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast, underscore beast, that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven. He's not an eighth. He is of the seventh form of government. And goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Those are the necessary ingredients to living for God. Called, chosen, and faithful. And he saith unto me, I the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. In other words, the political power will ride upon the, the power of this woman or this Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> Look at this. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Look at verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Rome reigned over the kings of the earth at the time that John wrote this book of Revelation. And Rome is built on seven hills. And one of the largest Catholic churches on, is 2,500. And I've been there. It's powerful. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church has martyred more people than any other single institution in the world. And they admit it. The reason that Jews have had such a difficult, difficult time with Christianity is because the only Christianity they know is the church from church history. They don't know that there are Judeo-Christians like us. A Judeo-Christian is one who believes in one God, who preaches exactly what the apostles preached in 33 AD. So when I witness to a Jew, I say to them, I'm not what you suppose. I believe in one God the way you do. I am a Judeo-Christian. Jews are very well educated. They know from that that I believe what the early Christians believed in the beginning, that I'm not connected to the church that evolved in church history. I'm not a Catholic. I am not a Protestant. The word Protestant, the etymology, is to protest. That movement was born out of the Dark Ages against the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Protestant. I'm not protesting anything. I am an apostolic Christian. I go all the way back to 33 AD. The others just evolved. I didn't evolve. I came into being with an experience from God, born again of water and spirit. It puts you in a whole different class, a whole different category. <laughs> Clap your hands and just rejoice in that for a moment because Jesus found you and gave this to us. Powerful. But... The understanding, the understanding that the Jews have of Christianity. During the Spanish Inquisition, they pulled millions of them apart on the racks. They brought Jews into magnificent Roman Catholic churches, gold and marble altars. And because they would not embrace Christianity, they beat their brains out and they fell on the marble floors, in the cathedrals, in the Catholic churches. That is what Christian, that is what Jews know about Christianity. So within my lifetime, there was a time in my early years, if you went to a Jew and told him you're a Christian, they would spit on the ground at your feet. But 
they have discovered in our day that there are Christians who are pro-Israel, who do not worship as the church in history worshipped. And it was Menachem Begin who discovered that the evangelical Christian was the greatest friend to Israel. In fact, it had such an impact that under uh, one administration here, we signed, I don't know, millions of signatures on a scroll and sent them to Menachem Begin, supporting him and the nation of Israel. It shook everything. Christianity has had such an influence on the government of Israel that they now have a Christian party recognized in the Knesset within the government of Israel. They say that evangelical Christians are the best friends they have, even better than the Democrats in America. Because we support them, we fight for them. Is that not amazing? All of these things are happening. See, people, while well, you live for God or don't live for God, or you're all just grinding around in ruts of nonsense and little things that aren't going to matter in a hundred years from now anyhow, all these incredible things are happening every day, every day. There's all kinds of things. There's enough in the news media that ought to cause you to come to church and just run the aisles and shout and dance. You ought to be, instead of these weak praise the Lords we have when we come to church, you ought, we ought to be grabbing each other and say, did you hear the news? Jesus is coming. The Bible is coming alive. Jesus is coming. Prophecy is taking place. We are seeing prophecy taking place every day. 19, 18, <laughs> this is the political, I can really get into this, political or commercial fall of Babylon in chapter 18. Uh, it says here, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power and all of that. In verse 2, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. It has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And it goes on. Verse 3, it says here, kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants, underscore near the end of verse 3, merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. And it continues. Verse 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Verse 7, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. That's Babylon. Verse 7 is the fall of business. Verse 8, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that great city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Verse 11, and merchants, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Here's why. You may not know this, but most ships of the earth fly under the Vatican flag because the taxes are cheaper. So when Babylon falls, the whole commerce throughout the whole world will fall. And it says here, that the ships at sea, um, here it is, 21, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more. Chapter 19. It's worship to the Lord here in verses 6, 7, Talking about the marriage of the Lamb is come, and that the bride is arraigned in fine linen, the righteousness of the saints. Then in verse 9, he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And it goes on with that. Look at this. In the verse 10, to I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have testified of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of prophecy. Look at verse 15. 
Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And of course, you can read the self-explanatory before that. But verse 16, I like this. And he hath on his vesture, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. Here's what's going on. <clears throat> Look at 18, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. In other words, the church will be caught away in the rapture uh, here. <clears throat> and there'll be a marriage supper of the Lamb. But at the Battle of Armageddon, when the, 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 the masses are slain that come against Jerusalem, there will also be what is called the Supper of the Great God, where God will call the fowls of the air to eat the flesh of kings and captains, etc., etc. So there are two great suppers, one in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb, one on earth, the fowls of the air eating the flesh of the wicked and those that cursed. God and would not keep his laws. And actually, at the end of verse 17, right in there, Zechariah 14. If we have time, we can go there. I may hold you a couple minutes longer. <clears throat> also, you may want to write near verse 14, Jude 14. Talks about coming with 10,000 of his saints. 15, Zechariah 14, verse 15 and 19, write Zechariah 14. Verse 20 of chapter 19, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire with brimstone that connects with where are the dead, as I told you. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Chapter 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And the scroll bound him a thousand years. I mean, if the devil was bound, for a thousand years and cast into the pit, there'd be automatic peace in the world, wouldn't there? Just, just get rid of him. It would be just peaceful. <clears throat> and he was cast in this bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations no more, verse 3, till the thousand years that should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. For, and I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. And for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, as we've already discussed. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Six, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. That's the martyrs. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners or quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, that is, Gentiles, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. These are Gentile hypocrites. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Can you imagine, after a thousand years of peace, the devil being chained, after seeing all the glory of God upon the earth and the things we've already discussed, the devil is loosed and people still turn and follow him after they've seen all of this. Jesus himself ruling before his ancients gloriously in Jerusalem. And yet when the devil is loosed, they'll follow the devil after a thousand years. The flesh is something, isn't it? 
10, and the devil that deceived them. In other words, but the judgment is swift. Once they've made their choice, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. Verse 10, and the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, as we've discussed, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. There was found no place for them. Twelve. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And I had you write in the before body, soul, and spirit. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to his works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here in chapter 21, we discussed John saying he saw new heaven, new earth. As we've discussed, there was no more sea. And then John saw the holy city in verse 2. It's interesting that the holy city is 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, a perfect cube. The holiest of holies, where the ark set behind the veil, was a type of the holy city. It, it was 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. The type and shadow carries through. In fact, I may have told you this, but I read an article which said that um, they have discovered a glowing light in space, brighter than any light they have ever been able to to find or to see or to focus upon. They have no explanation for it. They say it looks like a hole in space with this most brilliant light shining through from the other side. They have no explanation for it because it de defies all of the formats or whatever they call them in the um, vernacular of astronomy. They say it doesn't fit any of the, the formats they have. But there was someone in the research team that had gone to Sunday school, a Christian, and studied about some of the things, at least in part, knowing about a holy city. The statement they made at the end of the article, which I think was fascinating, they said, is it possible, this glowing light in space, the most brilliant light we've ever seen, that we have no explanation for, is it possible, could this be, that holy city coming down out of heaven, that the Christians, believe they will ascend to. That's very interesting that scientists would make such a statement, isn't it? Now, I mean, if scientists are talking like this, what should we be doing? We should be shouting it from the housetops. If they are beginning to talk like this, we should get involved like we've never been involved before. And it doesn't matter what people think about you, it doesn't matter what they say. How many of you are coming to believe that? You're beginning to realize that. People, it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what people say. You don't owe them anything. You have this. You have this. You have this. I've got it and I know that I've got it. A wonderful thing to know. So, <clears throat> it tells you about the length and the breadth of it. Now, toward the end of chapter 21, if you look at verse 21, it says, in the twelve gates, he's describing the holy city here. He says, in the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold. And it, as it were, transparent glass. The holy city, the streets are gold. The tabernacle, the floor was sand. What a difference. Isn't it? Tremendous. 22, it says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. During this thousand years of peace, I mentioned this already, the holy city, which we will have been raptured into, will hover over the earthly Jerusalem, and it will be the light of that city. That's what it's talking about here in Revelation. So, but I want you to do something. I want you to draw a line clear between, clear across between verses 23 and 24.
because the city had no need of the sun. That's talking about the millennial earth. So that has to do with 23, the millennial earth above the line after the word thereof. But then in 24, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. It's the holy city shall shine down on Jerusalem during the earthly Jerusalem during that thousand year period. And they shall bring glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The last chapter, and I find this very interesting. If we went into Ezekiel in chapter 47, and above chapter 22, you can write Ezekiel 47. It talks about, um, we could go there for a moment if you'd like. Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel chapter 47. <clears throat> Ezekiel is having this vision. He's also there in Babylon. Remember that? In fact, some authorities say if it had not been for Ezekiel, we'd never heard of Daniel. Ezekiel was the one who did some writing and recording. Ezekiel was a noble character. He was one of those princes, the good figs, that was carried away in 606 BC, as we discussed. Here, Ezekiel is having this vision. He said in verse 1, After he brought me again to the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. This has to do with the temple in the millennial reign during the thousand years of peace. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. It goes on. And it says, Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gate, by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side, right in their throne of God. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. So the water was ankle deep. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. He keeps measuring as to the loins. Afterward, there were waters to swim in. Remember I told you that when Jesus set foot on the mount, sets foot on the Mount of Olives, that the mountain will cleave in the midst, and I told you that the waters of the Mediterranean Sea will come through, and Jerusalem will be a seaport. We discussed that already. Look at verse 10. Verse 8. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, that be the Dead Sea, which being brought forth in the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it goes on. It says here in verse 10, It shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi, even unto uh, an Iglim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea, underscore great sea, that has to do with the Mediterranean Sea, exceeding many. And it talks about here in verse 12, And by the river, upon the bank thereof, and on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to its months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, underscore sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine, underscore the word medicine. So here's what you're seeing here, and then we'll go back to Revelation chapter 22. <clears throat> this Ezekiel saw that during that thousand years of peace, there would be a river that would proceed, begin to flow from beneath the throne of God, during that thousand year reign, and the waters would go out so far, and they would get be ankle deep, knee deep, 
waist deep and finally waters to swim in. In other words, Jerusalem will be a seaport. But along the sides of that river there are these trees that grow and it says, as we've just read, what will be on these trees. Now go back to Revelation chapter 22 and look at this. John said in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Underscore healing of the nations. This is what you're seeing. After the terror, the ferocity of the tribulation period, with burnings and all kinds of famine and desolation and torment and scorpions and uh, rather locust and all the plagues we've discussed, you can understand that the end of that period of time was so much death that there would be a great deal of disease upon the people that survived after that seven years of tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. But the leaves of the trees on the shores of this river where the waters flow out from beneath the throne of God, they will come and get those leaves for healing and their bodies will be healed of the diseases and the injuries that were inflicted during that tribulation period. How great is our God. How great is our God. And for your interest, they have now discovered there is a rushing river under the Temple Mount right now. They will not allow Gentiles to go down there. It's in the hands of the Orthodox Jews. But there is a river already flowing underneath the Temple Mount now. I reiterate, the stage is set, the players are all in place, and we are a part of those players because God is shaking everything that can be shaken, and only that which cannot be shaken will remain. But the Holy Ghost will fall on those that cannot be shaken, and they will run with it, and they will reach this world. We are headed for the greatest move of God the world has ever, ever, ever known. Jesus said in verse 7 of 22, Behold, I come quickly. <clears throat> 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root or the spirit, and the offspring or the flesh of David, and the bright and morning star. He says here, And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, in verse 17, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We are that generation that God will entrust with his might and his power. Before Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, there will be mighty apostles and mighty prophets that will rise on the scene and will shake this entire world before the coming of the Lord. And I want to be a part of that number. I want to be involved with the greatness of the move of God in these closing hours of time. The door is beginning to close rapidly to the Gentile dispensation 
and Israel is home again, and the nations of the earth are forming against her, exactly as the Bible would say. The door is beginning to close to the Gentile dispensation. It's beginning to open to Israel. God is getting the church ready for the rapture, but he's getting Israel ready to rule the world. That's where we are, and we've studied all through it here tonight. This future is ahead for Israel, but we will be lifted out of that pressure and all of that torment before the coming of the Lord. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Help us. Give us an earth-shaking revival. Use us mightily, O Master of the universe. I pray by the authority of your word, by the power of your word that has been spoken, by the power of your name, Jesus. Hear us, O Master of the universe. Use us mightily in these closing hours of time. Shake this present world. Give us, O Lord, the anointing like we've never had it before. God, I walk among these people tonight, and I am asking for anointing to fall upon these people here tonight, unlike anything they have ever known or could even dream of, that such an anointing will come upon them, that fire will be upon them, that all of their enemies will be turned backwards. Oh God, I'm asking here tonight, <clears throat> allow the councils that are formed against us to be turned into foolishness as you turned the councils of Ahithophel into foolishness where David was concerned. Allow the councils that are formed against us to be turned into foolishness. I pray that your judgments, O oh God, will fall upon this present world, that we will rescue the perishing, O oh God, that the hungry and the thirsty will come forth that there will be, as it were, a sword of the Lord that will go forth from our mouths and that we will preach with such, such power and such authority that no devil in hell nor combination of devils will be able to fight it or to stand against us because it is written, Greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. Oh, Holy Father, anoint us mightily, I pray. Give us, O oh Lord, I pray, the latter rain.